but let me start out by telling you about Leona Helmsley. Anybody ever heard of Leona Helmsley? Leona Helmsley, okay? Those of you that uh, fancy yourselves, you know, uh, like, you know, you, 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 you love the 80s. You know, Leona Helmsley was from the 80s, popular in the 80s. Um, and, and she was she was actually a billionaire. In 1989, she was a billionaire. She owned a string of hotels. She actually owned the Empire State Building. Okay, anybody ever heard of the Empire State Building? Okay, Leona Helmsley actually owned it. And yet in 1989, she was convicted on 33 counts of tax evasion for which she actually spent time in prison a billionaire but didn't want her to pay her taxes why because she was greedy now you know nobody wants the the government to have more than their share but obviously this uh, goes above and beyond this woman was so greedy that after the sudden death of her only son at the age of 40 when he was 40 this happened in 1982 she sued and won the share of his estate, which was a measly $149,000, which to you and I, that's a big deal, but $149,000 to a billionaire, it's a drop in a bucket. But doing so, she left his four children, her four grandchildren, with $432 each, and his widow, her, her uh, daughter-in-law, with $2,000. $171 from his estate. That's how greedy this woman was. And certainly money can root itself deep in our hearts. And we can find ourselves, you know, struggling with that money. I don't remember if it was on a Wednesday night just recently or on, it's probably a Sunday morning, two Sunday mornings ago when we started talking about greed on Sunday mornings in our study through numbers. Remember that? And uh, I was talking about how generous we are when we're young we are so generous with our parents money like oh let's you know that guy's asking for money at the gas station mom and dad come on let's give him some money you know and come on you, you just want to hand out your parents money and then when you start making your own money all of a sudden it's no way you ain't getting nothing from me man I, you know go and work for your own because this is my money you know we can be so very greedy and we as christians we have got to be careful that we not allow that greed to take root in our hearts we can't do that Okay? And we have, to, we have to be givers. And so uh, tonight, and again, next time, we'll, we'll learn some more about this. But in chapter 8, we've got three main divisions. Paul is going to tell us how to give. He's going to give us his advice on the matter. And then we will talk about handling money. Okay, Some really good biblical principles in here. Uh, and again, if you're thinking, well, I don't have any money of my own, so this really doesn't apply to me. No, there are some great principles to take note of and be ready for when you do start giving, getting, getting your own money. Or even uh, how, just, just how, you're to, how you're to handle things just in general. What do you have that you can give? And how do you handle that? So some valuable biblical principles in here. So let's get into the first section here, verses 1 through 9, which is how to give. And the first thing that he's going to do is tell them how to give like a Macedonian. A Macedonian. Wasn't that one of those, those like uh, dinosaurs that were, no, not a Macedonian, no. Macedonian, what was a Macedonian? Verse 1, moreover, brethren, okay? Moreover, brothers, he says, also, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed or showered on the churches of Macedonia. Now, just so you know, for reference, Corinth was in the southern part of Greece. Macedonia was in the northern part of Greece. And Paul, in beginning to talk to them about giving, he says, hey, listen, we've got some family members up in Macedonia, the northern part of Greece, and some Christians there, and uh, the grace of God has been showered on them. Now, he's going to tell us about this grace. I mean, everybody's, God's grace has been showered on everybody. What is he talking about? Well, in verse 2, he says that in a great trial of affliction, so they were afflicted, they're going through a difficult time, the abundance of their joy. What a strange thing, that they would be experiencing affliction and at the same time, an abundance of joy. It says there are the abundance of their joy, so their joy and their deep Poverty, D 
Deep poverty means that they were suffering financially. Now remember that the series is called Saints and Sufferers, and suffering seems to be a common theme through many of these chapters. And here we are again talking about the Macedonians that were suffering financially. They were experiencing some sort of hardships, probably persecution, and so they were suffering because of that. And they were suffering financially. It says their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. What? Okay, now, he hasn't said it expressly yet, but let me tell you what he's getting at. He's talking about the Macedonians giving, their generosity. And he says, even though they were experiencing affliction and deep poverty, out of that came an abundance of their joy. And all of these things, this mixture, abounded in the riches of their liberality. See, it's good to be a liberal. Ha! <laughs> okay. We want to be liberal when it comes to giving away, to being, to being givers. You and I want to hold the things of this world loosely. We don't want to white-knuckle the things of this world. Is money good? It certainly can be. It certainly can be. When you have money as a believer, you can bless all kinds of people. Not just your church, but you can bless all kinds of people. You can send high school students uh, to, uh, you know, on mission trips to Mexico or Nicaragua. You can uh, bless students, high school students at church, uh, with, uh, you know, to, to help them pay for camp, winter camp or summer camp. There's all sorts of good things that you can do with that money. We want to be liberal with those things. We want to be giving with those things. We want to hold those things loosely in our hands, understanding that what we have, anything that I have, has been put in my hands by God. And so, listen, it's, if he's given it to me freely, then I want to give it away freely. Okay? I want to give it away freely. I don't want to hold on to it too tight. And that was what the Macedonians were doing here. Now, we go on in verse 3 to say, for I, Paul says, for I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond ability, they were freely willing. That means that the Macedonians, when they gave, they did it sacrificially, we find out there. That they were suffering, and they were suffering not only affliction, but they were also suffering financially, and yet out of that, they still gave. And he actually says that they gave from their ability, what they were able to give. And then he says, but they actually went above and beyond that and gave. You see, that's sacrificial giving, and that's a good kind of giving. That's a, that's a good thing. To just throw someone, you know, three cents or 20 cents or something, you know, when I've got a pocket full of money, uh, can be seen as greed. I want to be careful with that. Is it good to give? Yes, it is. But I want you to understand that the Macedonians gave even out of their need. They had a need themselves, and yet they were so full of joy at the opportunity that they had to give money. And we'll talk about in a few minutes who they were giving money to, because that's important. But they were so excited to give money that they gave even beyond their ability, which means they probably dipped into their little reserve like, you know what, we're suffering financially, and, and, and maybe you know we're, we're coming up kind of short. But man, we're going to trust God, and let's, let's just go ahead and dip into that little bit of savings, and we'll take some out of there too, and we'll give some of that to bless these people. And so they gave sacrificially. We want to give sacrificially. We want to give even out of our need. We have needs, yeah. We have needs, sure. We got needs. But you know what? I've got needs, but maybe maybe this group of people over here, this person, maybe they have bigger needs than I do. And so, and so even though I have a need, you know what? I'm going to give anyways. And I want to be able to do that easily. Now, not only did they give sacrificially, but they gave urgently. Look at verse 4. They gave urgently, imploring us. That means that they were begging us. This is, this is quite a funny picture here. They were begging us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints, okay? So we'll talk about what he's talking about, ministering to the saints in just a minute. But they were actually begging Paul and his companions, like, please let us give you money. Please let us send money with you. 
You see, these are people, these Macedonians, who had experienced the grace of God, the goodness of God, the provisions of God. And they had, my guess is, they had at some point in the past learned how to give. And in giving, they had so much joy that even the afflictions that they were experiencing, the financial hardships that they were experiencing, those things could not hinder their giving. They were saying to Paul, they were imploring, begging him, please, 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 let me, let me, let's, let me send you some more money. Here, here's some more. Okay, wait a minute, I've got some more running back and getting into their little reserve, you know, and they didn't have a bank, you know, so probably going back to the house and digging in their clay pot, you know, wherever they, you know, their little personal home bank and digging money out of there and bringing it back in here, here, take some more to the people. They were sacrificial givers and they were urgent givers. I, please, I, 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 I want to give and I want to give as much as I possibly can. Some of you uh, went with us to Mexico and Nicaragua and you were there for the burrito sales, the breakfast burrito sales, huge hit. We had planned on, you know, we had a, a breakfast burrito sale for Mexico, and then we had come up with this grand scheme of doing uh, a pancake breakfast. And Pastor John's like, no way. The people don't want pancakes, man. They want breakfast burritos. Bring the breakfast burritos. And so we ended up doing breakfast burritos again. And you were there. Some of you were there. And there were people walking up, and they were saying, hey, uh, you know, yeah, I'd like a burrito. Here's 20 bucks. Really, a $20 burrito? It's like, this burrito's not worth $20. There were others who gave even more, gave them 50 Some walked up and gave money and said, no, I don't want anything, thanks. I just wanted to give. Those are givers. They gave sacrificially. They gave urgently. Now, what are we talking about here in verse 4? Who are they even giving to? Are they giving to uh, the guy, you know, at the gas station? You know, I talked to a gentleman named DeAndre over the weekend. I was gone, and I stopped at a gas station, and DeAndre came over, and he was asking for some money. And so I had a chance to talk to him, minister to him a little bit. What is he talking about here? Is he talking about giving to people, the homeless people that we might run across, you know, next to the freeway or at the gas station? Or what is he talking about? Well, here specifically, he says, imploring us in verse 4, begging us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. So what he's talking about is giving specifically to Christians. That's that word saints right there. He's not talking, when he says saints, he's not talking about a statue or a stained glass window. He's not talking about some person that lived a long time ago and now they're dead, but they've, uh, you know, they've been, um, uh, what's the word? I can't remember what it's called, but they've been made into saints. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about Christians. The word saints is another word. It's synonymous with Christians. You and I, if you are a Christian here tonight, you are actually a saint. Saint Christopher works really well, right? Saint Christopher. Uh, saint Cassius, okay? Let's let that roll right off the tongue. Saint Caden, you know? You're a saint. If you're a Christian, you are a saint. Saint Haley, Saint Hannah, you know? You just put your name in there. Put your name in the, in the blank space there. Saint Nick. Saint Nick. Do we have any Nicks? We don't have any Nicks in here. Sorry. Saint Joaquin. It's probably actually really a saint, I would imagine, but, but, but we're, we're all saints. Now, you may or may not remember, but I'll just remind you real quickly. In the last chapter of 1 Corinthians, okay, we're in 2 Corinthians. In the last chapter of 1 Corinthians, he talked about collecting money for the suffering saints in Jerusalem. That means there were Jews in Jerusalem who actually had come to Christ. They were saved. They were Christians. And because of that, they were suffering, which it's very possible that's why the Macedonians were suffering. You know, I, I want you to understand something, that at that time, it, it could even happen today, but especially at that time, if you get saved, if you got saved uh, in, in a, either a, a, a godless community or for the Jews in their Jewish community, and you went into the marketplace and everybody knew that you were a Christian, there were many people who would not sell to you. They, did, they didn't want to do business with you. So you would find yourself coming up short on groceries, on food, things that you were trying to provide for your family. Because you had uh, uh, identified with Christ, because you had surrendered your heart to Christ, become a Christian, 
There were people who no longer wanted to deal with you. And that was happening with the Jews in Jerusalem. And so Paul was collecting money to take to Jerusalem. And the Macedonians said, man, we want to give. And we got a little bit more. And hold on, I've got a little bit more. Hold on, please, 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 wait. You know, I'm begging you, wait, I want to give you some more. They gave sacrificially, they gave urgently. But they also gave according to the will of God, according to God's will. Verse 5, and not only as we had hoped, they had hoped to collect something, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. It's always good to give according to the will of God. It's always best to give your heart to God first. You know, for someone to just give money to God, but their heart doesn't belong to God, it's no good. It's a, it's a bad deal. Because what God wants, God doesn't want our money. What he wants is our heart. If he has our heart, then he has access to all that we have. Then all of it is his. And what he's saying about the Macedonians is, yeah, they gave. But they gave their hearts to the Lord first. What a sweet uh, group of people the Macedonians must have been. In verse 6, he says, So we urged Titus that as he had begun, so he would also complete this grace in you as well. So evidently Titus had started collecting, started doing this work with the Corinthians. And so they told Titus, hey, you need to, you need to finish. You want to you wanna complete that grace in them as well. Verse 7, he says to the Corinthians, but as you abound in everything, he says you're growing, you're growing in everything, in faith, in speech, knowledge in all diligence we'll talk about what diligence diligence is a little bit later and in your love for us they were abounding in all of those things paul says see that you abound in this grace also in giving giving is a part of the christian life it's a good thing it's something that you and i want to get in the habit and practice of doing now it's difficult for a group of young people who maybe again maybe you're not working so you might go, well, you know what, I don't, I don't have any money. So what does that mean? That, that God, you know, that I don't have to be a giver? No. What do you have right now? If you don't have money, do you have time that you can give? You go, no way, man, my time's all taken up. But, but that's what you have. You don't have money, but you do have time. And you can cut out some of that time to give to the Lord or to give to other people in the name of the Lord or to give your time to God's people that maybe are in need. Maybe there are Christians that you know of that are in need of just someone to sit and listen. And you go, yeah, but he or she, they're just so weird. That's why nobody wants to listen to them. I know. But join the club. We're all weird. Right? Do you really know anybody normal? I mean, other than yourself, of course, you know, because you're so normal. But all the rest of us, you know, we're all so strange. We're all so weird. But maybe you have time that you can give. And you know what, with your time, you know what kind of giver you want to be? You want to be a sacrificial giver. Oh, but man, I was going to catch up on, you know, my favorite anime. But now you're telling me that, you know, I, I should go hang out with this person? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm telling you. Come on. You can stream that anytime, right? Stay up late and watch that. Don't do that. <laughs> but maybe you have time. Give it urgently. No, please, please, please. I want to devote my time to somebody, to something. Let, let me give it, please. Let me, let, me, let me give sacrificially. Let me give urgently. But let me also give according to God's will. Let me make sure that my time, if that's what I've got, that I give that to God first. And then I take the, other, the rest of the time that I have and I give a portion to that to maybe some Christians that are in need. That maybe they just need somebody to sit down and listen to them for a while. Just hang out with them for a while. Maybe it's somebody younger. Maybe it's a younger Christian. And they need a little bit of discipleship. And, and you can help them with that. And you think, well, you know what, I'm not like a super, you know, I'm not a pastor. I don't know how to do that kind of stuff. No, you just partner up with them and you, you just teach them how to follow the Lord the way that you're following the Lord. Maybe it's time. Sacrificially give it. Urgently give it. Give it according to God's will. But Paul, talking to Titus here, he says, listen, you should start what you're doing. I mean, continue what you're doing. And in verse 7, he says, you need to, the, the Corinthians, abound in this also. You're abounding in other areas. You're growing in other areas. 
grow in this one also in giving. Verse 8, I love that Paul makes this clear. I speak not by commandment. What that means is this. This is very important. You need to understand this. Because in a few, uh, just in a, in a verse or two, we're going to get the word advice. Paul's going to give his advice. It's, it's it, uh, super important that you understand the difference here. Paul says, I'm not speaking by commandment. In other words, what he's saying is, the word of God does not command these things. That, he's making that clear. I speak not by commandment, but I am testing the sincerity of your love by the diligence of others. The Macedonians are givers. They're diligent to give. And he says, I'm testing you, Corinthians. Are you going to give like the Macedonians? But the next thing he does is he tells them how to give like Jesus. You go, oh, really? Everybody knows that Jesus was the greatest giver ever. You had to bring him in on this thing? Yes. Perfect example. He says in verse 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich. Did you know that Jesus was rich? In what way? Financially? No, not financially. But he was with the Father, right? I mean, that's, that's rich. You don't get any richer than that. Okay? He was God in flesh, God the Son. That though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. So Jesus, he's, Paul is talking about here about the fact that Jesus went from being in heaven with the Father in the presence of God. And then took those steps down. Philippians chapter 2 tells us about those steps that he took down. To come and live a life here. And he went, he got so low. Let me, let me tell you how low he went. He became a guy. That's how low he got. And it says that he was obedient, even to the point of death. He was obedient. So Jesus humbled himself in order to give. He says that he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that through his poverty we might become rich. So we experience blessings untold maybe not financially but i think we've all been blessed financially i look around you're all dressed pretty nice you got some pretty nice clothes on you've been blessed financially you've been well taken care of provided for okay but i i don't i really don't know if any of you in here are rich or not and i don't i'm not even sure like what does rich even mean really you know what i mean but but we've been blessed but the point that paul is making is is that we were spiritually poor poverty and yet we became rich because of Jesus. So in other words, there's two things about Jesus. How to give? Jesus gave sacrificially. He sacrificed what he had so that we could be blessed, so that we could become rich. And there's another word here, and it is completely. Jesus gave completely, though it is not expressly said here. We all understand that Jesus gave himself completely. When he gave, Jesus gave well, we want to be that same way, sacrificially, like Jesus, like the Macedonians. But we want to give completely. You know, that doesn't mean that when I'm giving my money that I need to empty out my bank account and give it totally, completely to somebody. That's not what he's saying. But what, is, what, we're, what we're being taught there is that we give sacrificially and then we give completely with all of our heart, that we're fully convinced that, no, this is, man, I'm giving it away. This is yours. I'm, I'm going to give it, and I'm not going to be sorry that I gave it. I'm going to give it and not regret that I gave it. Jesus didn't ever, you know, like, oh, I wish I wouldn't have uh, given myself, you know, given, given all of my sacrifice for those people. Look at them. But he gave completely, and he didn't hold back anything. I want to learn to give like that. I want to learn how to hold the things of this world loosely in my hands. And, and how, to be, how to be satisfied with either very much or very little. That was Jesus. He did not hold on to this world so tightly that, that you know, he didn't want to let it go. Whatever he had, he gave it. 
Now Paul, what he does here in verses 10 through 15, is he gives his advice, and he says that very plainly, verse 10. And in this I give advice. Now let me just tell you something. Verses 10 through 15, I'm going to put it up here. This is what he's mainly saying. He's saying, finish what you started. Corinthians, you started giving, finish that. Finish collecting and get ready to send it. Okay? Okay. But there are a couple of other things in here. He gives us a couple of reasons why they should finish what they started. Verse 10. And in this I give advice. It is to your advantage. It is advantageous for us to give. He says it's at, uh, it is to your advantage not only to be doing what you began. They started to give and were desiring to do a year ago. You know how that goes, right? Oh, I meant to do that a year ago. Right? Some of us, New Year's resolutions, you're like, ah, oh, I was supposed to start doing that a year ago. Right? This coming, you know, December as it gets closer, you know, you'll see everybody putting up their New Year's resolutions and, you know, putting it on TikTok or, you know, their Instagram or whatever. And they're just like, yeah, this is what I'm going to start doing in the new year, man. Making their resolutions and you'll be like, oh, yeah, I was, I was supposed to do that last year. That's how it goes. Sometimes you start something and then before you know it, the year's flown by and ah, oh, I never did it. He says what you started to do a year ago, verse 11, but now you also must complete the doing of it. That as there was a readiness to desire it, so so evidently in the past they were, they were, they desired to give. So there must also be a completion out of what you have. Verse 12, for if there is first a willing mind, so they were willing it is accepted according to what one has and not according to what uh, he does not have. Well, again, what he's saying is finish what you started. You were willing to do it in the beginning. Now pick it up again and, and, and finish it. Finish doing it. It's advantageous for you. How is it advantageous for us to give? Well, again, it teaches us how to hold the things of this world lightly. You know, we're going to heaven. That's our destination. This world is not our home. We're leaving. We're, we're, just, we're actually just passing through this world. And we're going home. And the only thing that we can take with us to heaven is other people. The clothes that we have and the special jewelry. And I know, you know, Grandma gave that to you or Grandpa gave you his pocket watch or whatever. You know, the special thing. They're special, but they're of this world and they'll end up staying here. They're great for now. But we're going to heaven, and we're not taking all of this nice stuff with us, all of our clearance rack clothing. I don't know if you, you know, I, for me, you know, it's like, I'm, i got to leave this here. Wow, you know, what a sacrifice, you know. It can stay. What we started, let's finish. It's advantageous for us. It teaches us how to hold these things loosely. But also, he gives us another reason, and that is, that is that we have the ability to help. Verse 13, he says, For I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened. Okay? He says, I'm not telling you to give so that you have nothing and now you're suffering. He says, verse 14, but by an equality. He says, just give so that everybody's equal. Sounds like communism. <laughs> Except that this is voluntary. It's not forced by the government. Even Paul's not forcing it. He's challenging them. But he says, let's make everybody equal. But there's a reason for that. Verse 14. That now at this time, your abundance, so evidently the Corinthians had an abundance financially, may supply their lack. Ah, oh, there it is. They were lacking. That their abundance also may supply your lack that there may be equality. What he's saying is, he says, you guys have an abundance. Give a little bit to the Jews in Jerusalem because they're lacking, and that'll help bring them up a little bit. He says, and then in the future, if you guys are lacking, then they'll hear about it, and they'll give. And everybody can be equal. As it is written, he who gathered much had nothing left over, and he who gathered little had no lack. He's referring back to Exodus and when they were gathering the, the manna, you know, they gathered enough. Everybody, everybody had enough, had what they needed. And so um, 
uh, Saturday night. It was kind of late, and uh, uh, I we had stopped at uh, The Habit. How many of you like The Habit? Mm, godly, right? The, chi the chicken sandwiches, their fries. I, I uh, every once in a while, but yeah, it is, it's, it's good stuff. So I'm sitting inside, and then I had to go grab something from outside. I think maybe it was my glasses. I don't remember. So I go outside, and what do I see out there? I see, uh, I, as I walk out, there's, I can tell that there's a homeless guy there, but it's, I'm seeing his back. And so now I've got a choice, because I know what you know. It's cold out there, and homeboy's begging for money. And I walk out, and he doesn't see me. And I have a split second to decide... Maybe I don't need my glasses. I'll just go inside where it's nice and warm and eat my burger while this guy stands out here hungry. He turns around, sees me. He's got the cutest little puppy inside of his jacket, right? And he's like, hey, can you get me something to eat? And, you know, for me, that's like, you know, if you're just asking me for money, then, then uh, Mr. Homeless Guy, get ready for, for a sermon. Because, uh, you know, I, I, got, I got five points and, you know, and I'm going to do an altar call at the end, okay? Because let's just talk about you asking me for money. And because, I, you know, there's a, I, I have a little bit of an issue with that. But this guy turns around and he's like, hey, can, I, can you get me something to eat? And then all of a sudden my heart, I mean, I know, I'm super macho and manly. But my heart just melted like, oh, this guy's asking. He's not asking for money. This guy's asking for something to eat. Now, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Nah, dude. I don't even think you're a Christian. Get out of my way. I don't think your dog is Christian either. I don't get my glasses and go inside, sit down and eat my burger and my fries. You know, what am I going to do? Come on. I had the opportunity. I had an abundance. I had the opportunity. Actually, I wasn't eating a burger. I was eating chicken nuggets or whatever they call them there. But, but uh, I, I had the opportunity out of my abundance to be able to fill some of his lack. Now, I didn't have enough to, you know, obviously deal with all of his issues. But I did get to stand out there for a few minutes and talk to him and minister to him also. But that's the idea. Now, that guy, uh, to my knowledge, he was not a Christian. But it, that's the idea is that I've got an abundance certainly I can share. Now, I do want to use wisdom. I don't want to just go out handing money to everybody that I see on the street because the truth is, and I've worked with homeless people a lot throughout the years, the majority of homeless people, they want money so that they can go buy something to drink, like a beer or wine or something like that, some kind of liquor, or they want to buy some drugs to shoot in their veins or to snort. That's the truth. So that's why I'm not just handing out money to people. I'm not doing that. You want some money? And... I might give you some money, but if I give you some money, you're going you're gonna to have a seat because i got a sermon and I want to share with you something, you know. So, so we're, I'm not just handing out money. I'm not Santa Claus, man. I'm not just throwing money out there. I don't want to I don't want to contribute to people's problems, you know, to their issues, to, to the things that they're, you know, the vices that they have. But that's the idea is that I have an opportunity. They had the ability to help. So finish what you started. Now, again, maybe you don't have money. Maybe I'm talking to people that largely, you know, say, I don't have money. What should I do? Well, you got time. And, and I would say what Paul says, listen, finish what you started. You ever thought, you know what, I'd, I'd really like to just be able to minister to somebody. You've ever had that thought? Like, you know what, I don't really have a lot of money, but, you know, I mean, I could talk to people or listen to people or listen to their problems. Great. Finish what you started. You thought about it. Now, now pursue that. And when you do it, it's going to be advantageous to you. It's going to teach you how to give. It's going to teach you how to be selfless, but it's also going to give you the opportunity. It's advantageous because it gives you the ability to help somebody else, to bless somebody else.